So troops, how do aircraft carriers work? We do a lot of content on the military, but today we're going to find out how these cities at sea actually work. It's going to be a good video. We're going to be reacting to this, going back to the old school stuff. Hopefully you guys can enjoy that. Please like, share and subscribe to the channel and enjoy troops. Let's go. A single aircraft carrier is enough to markedly change the level of a nation's military might. These ships are one of the strongest single assets a military can have. In general, under international law, aircraft carriers can legally position themselves up to 14 miles or 22 kilometers from any country's coast. I didn't know that. Generally didn't know that. I've spent quite a bit of time on an aircraft carrier. Um, pretty good. I oh, say aircraft carrier. That for, for what the British Royal Navy has got, it's um, it's not not as good as it used to be. Put it that way. Really, the strategic influence of being able to place a military airbase just miles from any coast in the world is enormous, especially given that 80% of the world's population lives within 60 miles or 100 kilometers from the ocean. While plenty of military vessels are capable of launching helicopters, there are just 19 aircraft carriers worldwide currently in service capable of launching fixed-wing airplanes. China, Thailand, India, Russia, and France each have one. That might have changed slightly. This video is about four-year-old, five-year-old. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's obviously going to be the big five, six countries anyway. But that being said, the United Kingdom has since updated their um, naval capability. There's one thing that I didn't really like that much with the Royal Navy is the fact that we, as a Royal Marines commando, were very heavily reliant on getting transported around by the Royal Navy, whereas the Americans, the US Marine Corps, they have their own means and ability to get around on their own ships, which is something that I wish we had, and we don't. We heavily rely on the Navy for that. Italy has two, and the US has the 11 largest in the world. These largest carriers require over 6,000 people to operate and often stay deployed for up to a year. Right, so just to give you a little bit of food for thought, that is the entire Royal Marines right there, give or take a few hundred people on a good day. So the entire Royal Marines being on one ship, <laughs> just for context, and we can do some damage as a small corps. One ship, entire um, amount of people. That's insane. There are fully fledged cities at sea. The most advanced aircraft carriers like the French Navy's Charles de Gaulle are capable of launching an aircraft every 30 seconds. That means that, for a brief period, when launching aircraft at its maximum rate, the aircraft carrier Charles de Gaulle becomes busier than Charles de Gaulle Airport in Paris. To be able to achieve... <laughs> That's absolutely insane. Granted, it wouldn't be able to sustain that for a long period of time. Um... You know, and obviously they haven't got that many aircraft on there, although it's a beast and that is a monumental feat. Uh, yeah, to be busier than the actual airport in France. Something special, man. And that airport is crap. If you've ever been there, guys, honestly, try and miss it out, man. Such a capability on a moving ship is no easy feat. While the operation of these vessels gives militaries enormous strategic advantage, they also represent one of their greatest operational challenges. Look at that. An aircraft carrier's offensive weapon is its aircraft. On board, carriers tend to only have a small number of defensive weapons such as surface-to-air missiles and machine guns. Right, would you class the US Marines as a defensive weapon? I would, just in terms of their amphibious capability, being able to deploy at short notice on that ship via ribs or smaller craft getting to the enemy positions, pirates or even ashore, I would say it's one of the most important um, assets that they could have in terms of a defensive weapon system. But we're talking about the bigger hardware stuff. But of course, just like any powerful military asset, these carriers are big targets. It is for this reason that carriers never travel alone while on deployment. While the exact composition can change depending on the mission, the carrier strike groups American carriers travel with are typically made up of a guided missile cruiser equipped with Tomahawk missiles, two guided missile destroyers, an attack submarine, and a supply ship. An aircraft carrier is the flagship of this strike group, meaning that, in its command area, it not only has a bridge and an air traffic control center, there you go. That's a rather ripping tash that he's got there. And uh, that's exactly how the Navy would work. Look at that there. This guy has a rather ripping tash. And this dude here with his mug of coffee. Man, the Navy, you know, they get a lot of stick for not working hard and stuff like that. Trust me, guys. You know, they get a bit of un unnecessary banter and stick. The Navy work very, very hard, okay? Um... And I think they deserve more credit, personally speaking. Center, it also has a flag bridge where an admiral commands the entire strike group. 
Each of the group ships serves some combination of offensive and defensive roles. The only exception is the supply ship. Most aircraft carriers don't need regular refueling. All 11 American carriers and the French one are nuclear powered, meaning they can sail an unlimited distance for 25 years without refueling. 25 years. Uh, don't think I've been subject to that information before, but that is absolutely mental. The only thing that they're restricted by is the actual real humans on board, okay? <laughs> Who need food, water, sustenance, um, rest and recuperation, okay? We're not machines. We can't just do that all the time. So in actual fact, the ship is um, more more seaworthy than the humans, okay, in terms of its longevity, its ability, and capability. 25 years is nuts. Uh, and then again, in terms of resupply, they don't even need to ever come ashore, if that's the case, because they could use other smaller craft to be able to resupply them from a distance, from afar. So technically speaking, 25 years, I wonder what the longest deployment is for the US Navy. That would be interesting. Even conventionally powered aircraft carriers like the UK's HMS Queen Elizabeth can travel up to 12,000 miles or 18,000 kilometers without refueling, making the need for stops infrequent. While an American or French carrier could hypothetically sail non-stop for years or even decades, what they can't do is carry enough food, which is always needed, and aviation fuel, which is needed for combat operations, to stay at sea for more than a few weeks at a time. It would be inefficient and place the carriers in a position of vulnerability to have to visit a port every few weeks to restock, especially during combat operations, so they don't. Right, so what's the actual point of having a nuclear, um, a, a nuclear ship, if that's the case? It's for longevity, it's to not have to refuel, but if they have to refuel other elements and parts of that ship, then what is the actual point of them having that capability? Surely being a nuclear ship is more, um, more risky in terms of if they were to be uh, took out of the battle, I don't know. It, it, it seems to me you don't want that, you know, happening at sea and a nuclear ship getting sunk or something, all of the fallout, the waste. Maybe I'm naive in thinking how it actually works. Let me know in the chat. They restock while at sea. The supply ships that move as part of the strike group will sail off to a nearby port to take on fuel, ammunition, food, and mail, sail back to the strike group, then match speed and maneuver alongside the carrier. From there, the two ships will shoot lines across to each other. These lines are used to pull hoses over to the carrier, which are used to transfer aviation fuel. To transfer solid supplies, there are two methods. The first is attaching pallets to dollies that wheel cargo over to the carrier like a zip line. The second method, which is considered simpler yet more dangerous, is using helicopters to pick up pallets from the resupply ship and flying them over to the carrier. These transfers bring both crucial supplies like food and some less crucial items like mail, but this isn't the only way mail- Nah. Mail is is, uh, is a crucial item, okay? Depending on how long you've been on that ship. I remember when I was on uh, HMS Ill Illustrious, I think it was, uh, right before it got decommissioned, and I didn't receive any mail, and all the lads did. My wife, you ought to blame. Mail arrives on American aircraft carriers. Each carrier actually has a mailing address, just like any building in the U.S. For example, this is the USS Gerald R. Ford address. Families of sailors can send mail to these addresses in the same way that they could to any other, and, in fact, it costs the exact same as a shipment to any other US address, even if the ship is on the other side of the world. Sailors can even order packages online to their ship. Expedited mail often makes it from an address in the US to a carrier sailing somewhere around the world in just 10 days. Having that's pretty efficient, guys. This speed requires more frequent deliveries than those of the logistic ships, but conveniently, carriers are airports at sea. American carriers currently... Yeah, so when we look at it that way, it's not really... Uh, it's not really too difficult, really, okay? Yeah, you've got the address, the aircraft at sea, you know, you can get air mail. It's, um... I mean, it seems really obvious when they mention it like that. Use a fleet of C-2 Greyhounds as cargo aircraft, providing a high-frequency, often daily connection between carriers and shore. When cruising in the South China Sea, for example, as the USS Ronald Reagan did in November 2018, mail might be sent to Singapore via conventional means. A C-2 Greyhound would then fly from the ship to Singapore, pick up the mail, and fly back to the ship. Yeah, I guess things have changed in the South China Sea. Um, especially this year and back end of last year, we're looking at, you know, quite a few problems close to the region in terms of uh, how Taiwan is going at this moment in time, guys. It's not looking great at all there. As carriers sail around the world, the pickup points of the C2 Greyhounds are continuously shifted to nearby friendly nations. While mail does wonders for increasing crew morale, that's actually the lowest priority. Seriously, guys, morale is a massive thing when you're on ship and in terms of getting post 
when you should off your loved ones, it means more than you'd imagine. Priority cargo for the C2 Greyhounds. The aircraft are integral for bringing on spare parts for all the carrier's aircraft and transporting VIPs, press, and other individuals to and from the carriers. The C2 Greyhound is about the same size as an Embraer 145, a civilian aircraft capable of carrying 50 people, so it's not tiny. The longest aircraft carrier in the world, which also happens to be the newest, is the USS Gerald R. Ford, but even she is only 1,106 feet or 337 meters long. With commercial airports, a runway of 5,000 feet or 1,500 meters, like the one at London City Airport in London, is considered short, while large airports like London Heathrow will have runways longer than 10,000 feet or 3,000 meters. So how do C2 Greyhounds and other aircraft on carriers deal with having runways of only 1,100 feet or 330 meters long? They don't. Right. So this is interesting. I've been on these things and, uh, you know, the, the American ships are a lot bigger. So naturally speaking, they've got a lot more runway to deal with. Granted, you have to have a minimum anywhere in the British military would be no different. But it's um, there's a lot of different techniques that they do use that I've seen myself. You know, you can use the rope winch systems and stuff like that. Still very, very dangerous, especially with the uh, infrastructure that they're dealing with in terms of the fighter jets and stuff. Very, very dangerous indeed. But um, what I am going to do is I think we're going to explore that a little bit more in the next video. I want to keep these videos around 10, 12 minutes long so you guys don't get bored. Um, and it obviously keeps it fresh, guys, all right? I think gone are the days of the 20, 30-minute videos now because, you know, the analytics just... People don't watch videos that long, all right? So I think we're going to do two parts to this. But nice halfway through the video, we're going to find out in the next video just how that all works, guys. But thanks for stopping by. I really do appreciate it. And um, if you want to support me a little bit further, please consider joining Patreon. All war content is deplatformed now in terms of, sorry, it's demonetized now. So can't really even cover Ukraine properly, all right? At the end of the day, doing those videos doesn't earn anything for the content creator anymore. So it's quite, it's really frustrating. So I'll be putting all that stuff on Patreon if you want to see that. Please consider joining, guys. It helps me out a bunch. But until next time, I'll see you next time, troops. See you later. Bye-bye.